Glad you could join us at Easter. It's the rowdy 12 p.m. crowd, Auditorium 2. It is an incredible honor that you guys are with us. We're so glad. We're so excited for what God is going to do in your heart today. And uh, it's, a, it's a special thing to devote and invest time and pursuit of Jesus and his presence uh, on Easter Sunday. And uh, we, get, we, we, we don't get you know, stuck on the fact that it's tradition. We're here because of him. We're here to celebrate him. We're here to celebrate what he did on the cross for us over 2,000 plus years ago. But he didn't just escape death. Three days later, he conquered death. Amen. And we're here to celebrate that. Once again, if you are new here, it is, an, it is incredible uh, uh, that you are here with us, uh, whether you came with family, friends, uh, coworkers, however you found your way to City Point Church, uh, it is a, truly an honor that you are here, and uh, we'd love to bless you and give you a gift bag and, and all that kind of stuff, so make sure you do hit that table up and, or come and shake our hands at the end of the service, and uh, we'd truly love to see how, what God is doing in your life and to see how we can connect with you, and, and uh, we just want you truly to encounter Jesus. Uh, we want you to have an experience. Um, his presence uh, doesn't just stay in the scriptures. His presence is tangible. It's real. What you feel in this auditorium, whether maybe you've, uh, I felt like there was a word for someone that you've, you've felt suffocated spiritually. And you've felt like you've been in this place where you, you can't breathe spiritual air. And today God is opening that up. And you're, you're bringing in a brand new life. And there's life in his presence. And it's amazing how his presence can recalibrate our hearts. And it can, it, can, it can adjust things and maneuver things. And so if you walk through these doors uh, weak and limping, if you walk through these doors hurting and in pain, if you walk through these doors just you cannot seem to muster up a fire for God, uh, lean in because the Holy Spirit will do something in your heart. And he will continue to just stoke the embers of your heart and uh, point you to Jesus. Because when you look upon Jesus, something happens. When you, when, you, when you lift your hands to praise Jesus, something happens. When we lay hands on this, come on, something happens when Jesus... Jesus is in the room. Amen? So welcome, welcome, welcome to City Points. Uh, it is incredible to have you. Let's jump right into the Word of God and what he wants to do today. Turn with me to Matthew 28, 1 to 6 in the ESV. And uh, pull out all things technology, all things physical Bibles. Raise your hand if you actually have a physical Bible in the house. All right, okay, okay. All right, all right. Matthew 28, 1 to 6. When you're there, say, got it. When you're looking at the screen, say, got it. Say it a little bit louder, say, got it. Got it. Amen. Matthew 28 says this. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Verse 6, he is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come on, say it with me. For he has risen as he said. If you're writing notes, the title of my message today is The Roar of Resurrection. The Roar of Resurrection of resurrection. God, we just give you these moments together. Lord, it's not just a traditional walk through a service. Today is a destiny moment. Today is not business as usual, but it is doing business with God and wreaking havoc on hell and seeing freedom set free in people's lives because of the real Jesus that's in this room where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Lord, let this word transform and change in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Think about those sounds in life that get your attention. I remember when my daughter uh, went under in the pool, and my son just let out a shrieking scream, Dad, Dad, help Sienna, and I had to run around the corner and save her and pull something off her so she, wasn't, she wouldn't drown. But that, that shrieking scream got my attention. Or maybe the attention of, a, as a 16-year-old, that first time when the cop's lights go off behind you and the, and the siren, you know, how many know how you feel when that, when that happens, Right? Or that sound that gets your attention when a tornado siren goes off. Grade two, Green Mountain. Uh, we lived up in Green Mountain, and I remember the, when the tornado siren went off, and you could actually see the clouds starting to swirl. And I remember the, the, as a, as in grade two, the only thing that I thought is I need to save my Super Nintendo. <laughs> Mario and Luigi had to be saved. 
So I unplugged it all, put it in the, cl- the closet. But I remember probably one of the most captivating noises, one of the most awe-inspiring, fear-filled sounds that got my attention was the roar of a lion. And, uh, we were in South Africa on tour, and uh, we were, uh, had a day off, and so we got in a 12-seat 12 pas- 12 passenger van, and, and we went, and uh, there was a lion exhibit, in a sense, out in the wild. And so it was like a Jurassic Park-type experience. And uh, so you drive up to the fence, massive 25-foot fences, you know, with barbed wire and the whole thing. And so the, the, en- the first entrance of the fence opens up. The van goes in. Then it closes behind you. Then the next entrance opens up. And there's an overall of, of, of a road that goes around like this. And in the pasture and the grass in the middle, there's about eight or nine lions. And so, we, you know, we're just there to kind of watch the lions. And so we drove around. And we went around the corner, and then the South African driver stops, and he stops right there. And uh, the lions are, it's a cloudy day. It's pretty, it's in the day, so they're docile. They're not moving. They're not doing anything. And uh, so the South African guy goes, let's, let's have some fun. So he starts to rev the engine of the van. And uh, nothing happens. None of the lions move, nothing. So, so he goes, okay, let's do a little bit more to try to get their attention. So he, he drives fast for uh, two seconds and then slams on the brake and kind of does that jerking kind of moment. And that kind of gets this guy's attention. And he, st- he stands up, doesn't even look at the van, and just starts walking away. Slowly just starts walking away. And none of the other lines move. So we're like, okay, well, let's just get out of here. Nothing's happening. There's no excitement in the day. So we, the, the South African driver starts to drive up five miles an hour. And lo and be noticed, all of a sudden, out of the middle of nowhere, this lion lets out the most fearful, dreadful sound of a roar coming out of his mouth and starts chasing the van. And all the females are like, we want in on this too. There's some great meat inside of that van. We want want to partake in this feast that is now upon us. And I'm telling you, the the van's going crazy. My my wife is spilling out some PG-13 language. And it's just, it's all happening. But how many know the roar of that lion got my attention? Something got my attention. Uh, uh, Becky's parents, our global senior pastors, Mark and Lee Ramsey, were at a safari in South Africa, and they were staying in a treehouse one night, and not just staying in the treehouse, but uh, below them, at night, were all the lions. So the lions, you know, the, obviously they, they bring the ladder up, and they can't get to you, but below them were all the lions, and they could hear the roar, and they could hear them feeding, and all that kind of stuff, and uh, so Pastor Mark takes out his phone and records one of the lion's roars, and then he he takes that lion's roar and attaches it to his wife's ringtone. <laughs> you can ask Pastor Mark the next time he's here why he attached a lion's roar to his wife's ringtone. But in essence, a lion's roar is, is defining. It's arguably, arguably the most iconic animal sound in the jungle. A roar can he- be heard from miles away if the conditions are right. It can be raised to 114 decibels. That's about 25 times louder than a gas lawnmower. This roar has, a, has ability to, to, to ward off intruders, to put its foot down, to demonstrate ownership of that territory. And you've got to understand, there is a roar attached to resurrection. There is a sound that was released into the atmosphere sphere of humanity on that day over 2,000 plus years ago. That sound carried the roar of the king, the king that was not just going to escape death, but now conquer death in the tomb. And we today are looking not upon the cross, we're looking upon an empty tomb because Jesus, there was something that took place. God, Jesus went to the cross, a sacrificial lamb, but he came out of the tomb with a triumphant roar. He established something on that day. The prophet of Joel says, 3.16 says, the Lord will roar like a lion from Jerusalem. His loud voice will thunder from that city, and the sky and the earth will shake. Job 37.2 says this, says, listen, listen to the roar of his voice, to the rumbling that causes, that comes from his mouth. In Revelation 5, John begins to weep because he's sorrowful because there's no one found worthy to open the scrolls. 
in, the, in Revelations 5, but the elder comforts him and says this in Revelation 5, 4. Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed that he and he alone is able he and he alone is able through the sound that came through the resurrection. You and I are able to step into a place of not just salvation, but experience heaven on earth. Experience the absolute delight of the freedom of the gospel today because of Jesus. Because the Father knew that, man, I, yes, I need a lamb to go to the cross, but I need, a, I need a lion that will not back away, that will not retreat from anything or anyone. I need the lion of the tribe of Judah. See, there's a sound of this event, not just naturally, not just from the earth shaking and rumbling in Matthew 28, not just from the angel, not just kind of, not just little by little. Man, he rolled the stone away and sat on it to emphasize the fact of the victory that death died in that grave and Christ rose again. You need to understand, man, Christianity is not empty. Christianity is not weak. Christianity is not, is not a, a, a maybe so. Christianity is the exclamation point. Man, that there is a roar of resurrection. Come on, do you hear the roar? Do you hear the sound of resurrection? Is it getting your attention? Is it gripping your heart? Is it reestablishing something? Man, man God, I mean, man, he doesn't want just to captivate us in, in a once, once a year at Easter or once a year at Christmas. And hear me, hear me when I say this to the Christians that walk through the year, the, the, this, this house, and just you, you kind of wander in on Easter and wander in on, on, on Christmas. God wants all of your life. He doesn't, doesn't need a, a generation that just is, is enamored through a screen to watch a service take place. No, he needs believers that have captured the sound of resurrection and said, guess what? I'm about to do something about it. Guess what? I'm about to give my life to Jesus. The sound has a, the sound of the roar. It carries something. Number one is this. It, it's a roar of triumph declaring I have made a way for humanity to be forgiven of their sins. I have made a way for humanity to be forgiven of their sins. What is the greatest need in your life? You can think about it. What, what is the greatest need? What, maybe good health? We live in one of, my, one of the most fittest re regions in all of the U.S. Is it uh, money? Is it uh, maybe that promotion at work or is it a loving family? What is your greatest need? See, God thinks otherwise. When God saw humanity's problem, he didn't send a doctor to give us a physical exam. He didn't send a psychiatrist to analyze our emotions. He didn't give us prescription drugs to make us feel better. He didn't drop a bag of money or, or bring a philosopher to explain all things. He didn't bring a self-help formula so we could fix ourselves. He didn't bring in a system. He didn't bring just the idea of the kingdom. He brought us someone, and that someone was Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Because God knew the problem we are facing today the problem you and I are facing, the, the political problem, the sex trafficking problem, the, the, the injustice in this earth, the homeless problem, the problem is sin. The problem is sin. We we're facing this, this sense that the Hebrew word for sin is kata. It's, it's a transgression of religious law. It's a, an offense towards God. And I, I, for one, I hate sin. I hate what it's done to my life. I hate what it's done uh, to, to people in my life. I hate what it does to families. I hate the wreckage of sin. And our king in Proverbs 3, 19, 12 says this, a king's rage is like, a, is like the roar of a lion. He had a, that day he had rage towards sin. He hated the effects that what took place in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He, 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 that wasn't his plan. That wasn't what he desired. He didn't desire for you to, ha to go, go on a financial train wreck and get bankrupt. He didn't desire for you to experience divorce. He didn't desire to, for you to lose your son. He didn't desire for you to experience the, the, the mishaps, the brokenness, the evil. That was not God's plan. But sin came into the earth. And what sickness is to my body, sin is to my soul. Romans 4.25, God says that he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He was given over freely to death. A loving father, 
a good, good father so loved the world that he freely said, here you go. Take my son. Death, take my son. Justification means to be put right. Because of our sins, humanity was, is separated from God. If you're here today and you, you, you're a self-proclaimed atheist, my friends, one day you will find out whether your belief is true or whether the word of God is true. My friend, you need to challenge your, your beliefs. You need to challenge your mindsets and say, come on, if this, if this is true, you are separated from God and you're on a trajectory not to heaven but to the opposite. The reality is, is that Ephesians 2 calls us objects of God's wrath. Without putting our trust in Jesus, without Jesus doing what he was only able to do, we are now the objects of God's wrath. And so God had to take all the punishment, pull it off of Rick's shoulders, pull it off of Rich's shoulders, pull it off of every single one of our shoulders, every single decrepit sin, those, that deceitful thought, that gossip conversation, the sexual immorality, everything, and put it upon the shoulders of our Savior. Because he was the only way to justify humanity. This roar of resurrection re releases a shout into the atmosphere that there is hope and there is forgiveness that sin has been dealt with. And it confirms today, Resurrection Sunday, confirms that God accepted Christ's sacrifice. He accepted it. For sin on the cross, it gave us the access to a right relationship with Jesus. In James 1, 14, it talks about sin and uh, says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. What is this? It's painting, it's painting a picture that sin is never God's fault. That we are lured away by the, by the old nature, we're lured away by that broken nature. We're, we're lured away, and when we give into, it's called, it's like fishing metaphor in this passage for drawing prey away from shelter in order to trap them with a deadly hook. The Bible says that the devil is like, is like a roaming lion, is like, because the devil always wants to be God, wants to be in the place of creator, but he's like a roaming lion looking to seek who he will devour to seek, kill, and destroy. But this passage lets us know that sin is never God's fault. But God knew humanity needed help. He knew this is the gospel message. He knew that Jesus needed to prevail. He needed to fulfill his assignment. And in Paul, in Romans 6, says this, that you and I, because of Jesus, his death and resurrection, we're not only united with him in his death, but we're now united with him in his resurrection. So that same roar that took place in the tomb takes place in your heart. That same roar says you don't have to struggle with sin anymore. It says in Romans 6, 5, 6, it says that you are no longer slaves to sin. That, that once we're in the Old Testament it was the law, but then Jesus ratified that and brought in the season of grace. And grace says, hey, it's not about just living how I want to live. I'm a Christian. I go, I go to church. I do all these things. It's amazing. I'm helping the homeless. I'm, 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 I'm giving uh, generously. And, and then I go back and live how I want to. And I sleep with my girlfriend. And I look at that. And I drink that. And I take that. But the reality is, no, grace empowers righteousness in our life. Grace empowers a holy lifestyle. And there is hope. Guess what? Because every single one of us do not deserve this love. Every single one of us do not deserve this treatment, this amazing God that says you are now dead to sin, and the wages of sin is death, but the great gift of God is eternal life. Let me just tell you, the roar of resurrection is loud and clear. Love overcame all sin. And my friend, you can make a decision at the end of this service whether you've, you're an atheist, whether you're just a cynic, whether you just came with your family or friends and you've never heard, heard the good news of the gospel, that Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, died on the cross for your sin, for my sin, for your shame, for my shame. Undeserved, but yet you were worth the greatest purchase of all history. Number two is this. 
The roar of resurrection declares I made a way for humanity to be delivered from demonic torment. The roar of resurrection pierces the atmosphere and says, you don't have to be oppressed, tormented, imprisoned, in bondage, in stronghold, but yet there is freedom in Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago, on a Monday night, uh, there was a movie that was released by Pastor Greg Locke and a bunch of other pastors uh, that God is raising up in this deliverance movement that's taking place in the U.S. And uh, this movie was called Come Out in the Name of Jesus. And uh, incredible story about what God's doing all across this nation, all across the world. And uh, a couple pastors and leaders were there uh, in a public movie theater right here in northern Colorado. And at the end of the, the movie, Pastor Greg Locke gets up there and he starts to pray for people to be delivered from demons. And what happens? People started getting delivered from demons. And one of the manifestations of being delivered from a demon is vomit. And so there was people vomiting in popcorn bags. There was people being uh, manifesting and, and being delivered and set free right there in a public movie theater that you and I attend. And when you look to Scripture through the lens of deliverance, Mark 16, 17 says this, and these signs will accompany those who believe, you and I, these signs will accompany those who believe. The first thing on the list is in my name, not in Rick's name, but in my name, in Jesus' name, they will drive out demons. They will draw, oh man, the, 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 the demonic realm. I'm going to tell you, the devil and his little minions, they get freaked out when you and I all of a sudden come to a revelation that we carry the authority. That we, in his name, not my name, in his name, not in my perfection, his perfection, that we carry this authority to walk out. Let me tell you, God is, is, is raising up this deliverance movement. Why? Because Satan has made himself public. We see it all around. If you're, if you're not seeing it, we need to wake up to it. The reality is even Taylor Swift is now having satanic rituals within her concerts. There's a reason why Becky, she has a, these things called the waters, and it's discernment. She's got one of the greatest gifts of discernment. But she said, I, 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 don't, I don't feel like we should listen to Taylor Swift anymore. And hear me out. We're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not downing a gift or an artist. What we're doing is there's something spiritual taking place. It's not about the person. We love the person. We're praying for the person to be saved and set free. But it's, it's about the discernment, right? And so she said, I, I don't want to listen to her. So for months, we haven't listened to her. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, I'll follow suit. And so every time she, it comes on the radio, we're like, what's going on? But just recently saw a video that she's doing satanic rituals basically within her concerts. It's prevalent. It's in the public. It's in the media. It's out there. See, but the roar of resurrection is raising a remnant, an army, with a passion that not only hates sin, but with a passion that hates the demonic imprisonment that people that are struggling in witchcraft, people that are struggling with sexual perversion, pride, idolatry, bitterness, drugs, hallucinogenics. And there's three areas that really open up uh, people um, to the demonic. We've seen drug abuse, especially, like I said, hallucinogenics can really open you up uh, to the demonic. Sexual immorality, and now this is a pattern of habitual perversion in your life. That's why it's so important to get set free from pornography, to, to bring it into the light, to be accountable, uh, and also unforgiveness. Because unforgiveness can lead to birthing bitterness in our heart, and bitterness is like murder in diapers. It's undeveloped, and it's a sense of the reality is a lot of people, I mean, that, that's why we're seeing such bitterness and rage in the media is because sin has birthed bitterness in someone's heart, and they're carrying it out in rage, and the enemy is seeking for activity in your life in which he can partner with. Let me ask you this question. Can a Christian have a demon? You should have seen some of the 8 a.m. service when I said that, when I asked that question. They're like, oh. <laughs> Sitting back in their seats. Can a Christian have a demon? John Wimber says this. I don't know why you'd want one. They make horrible pets. <laughs> Lean in. Hear me when I say this. There's a difference between demon oppression and demon possession. Okay. This is why it's so important that you go through DNA, discipleship group, Holy Spirit baptism group, and also now our spirit war, warfare and deliverance class. 
When a person has a demon, it's when the demon controls the person. But when the demon has a person, it's when the demon owns that person. So a Christian can have a demon, but a demon cannot have a Christian. Meaning a Christian can have an area of your life that's influenced demonically, afflicted, and even tormented or controlled by the demonic, but their spirit, their spirit is owned by Jesus, therefore a demon cannot own a Christian. Does that make sense? We, when we give our heart to Christ, he fills our hearts, he saves us, now our spirit is owned by the Holy Spirit. But in our actions, in our deeds, we can partner and invite the, the, the sense of a, a demonization in our lives. So Derek Prince, the mighty man of God, uh, in one of his books talked about, uh, in the Greek, uh, demonization is demonized. So the, in the Greek, it talks about being demonized. It's not about control or ownership. It's about influence. So demons don't have the person, but demons control one particular area of their lives. So when God said, go and cast out demons, he didn't say go and cast out demons of unbelievers. He said cast out demons, meaning the entirety of, the God, of, of humanity. So that means unbelievers and believers. So in the same way, so imagine this. Imagine I went over to Pastor Rick's house. I love Pastor Rick's house. I'm jealous of Pastor Rick's house. I really want Pastor Rick's house. So I'm going to do anything I possibly can to steal Pastor Rick's house from Pastor Rick. I would go inside and definitely raid it and get out anything Kansas City Chiefs and burn it out back. But so, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to take your house, man. This is what I'm going to do. And so because I'm stronger than Pastor Rick, <laughs> even though he knows jujitsu, I studied kung fu in grade seven. So Bruce Lee would be anybody in jujitsu. So I would pick up Rick with, with the amazing strength that I have in my arms because I deadlift every single day. And so I'd, I'd pick up Pastor Rick. And I'd carry him out. And he would whimper like the biggest baby. Just, just speaking truth here, guys. It's the reality of it. <laughs> you can give me back. But I pick him up and put him outside and kick him in the butt and say, get out of here to go take an Uber somewhere. You know, and so. But how many know that Rick has legal rights for that house? So he can just get on the phone, call the cops, they'll show up to the door, they'll pull me out, and I, I, would, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd, I'd go kicking, but they, they'd pull me out because Rick has legal rights over that house. So in the same way, man, we should be so passionate to not want to see any believer demonized, tormented, frustrated, and afflicted. And I've shared this story before, but when we first moved here, it was like the first three months, and um, I remember being in a place where, uh, you know, God, this is all brand new, and God is doing something incredible. And one of the things that Pastor Mark always told us as pastors is when you vacay, when you do a vacation, don't vacation in the same state. Vacation out of state. Why? Why? Because when you're, it's like military, right? If, if I'm here advancing the kingdom of God, if we're here doing that, then all of the kingdom of darkness knows our names, knows the name of City Point. So we're working against the strongholds over Loveland, over northern Colorado, over Colorado itself. So we're here to advance the kingdom. But if I go to Arizona, they don't know who we are. So when we first moved here, I had never, never, I started fasting, we started praying, we started pressing in, we started, you know, uh, meeting together and discipling people and all that kind of stuff. And then one night at 3 a.m. in the morning, I was woken up and I have never in my entire life felt such a demonic stronghold. It's like torment. It was like dark, it just, like a black hole just swallowed all joy out of the room. And I was, I, I was trapped. I couldn't move my arms. I could barely, I couldn't even utter uh, the name of Jesus at the, at, the, at the first part of it. And so I was trapped on the, on the bed, and, and Becky was sound asleep. And, and so I just started praying in my head, and then finally, little by little, I could utter the name of Jesus. And then little by little, I started, yes, in Jesus' name, in Jesus, that's all I could say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden, my left hand got free, my right hand got free, and then I could sit up, and then I, you know, and then I, then I sat, and then I heard the Holy Spirit say, uh, look up Leviathan. 
And I'm like, what is Leviathan? I had no clue. I was, uh, you know, back in, the, back in Australia, we, we, we wrote songs and we produced music and, and you know, we, we, we raised up worshipers. I wasn't, wor- I wasn't dealing with the deliverance side of things or, or the spirit, that, that, that sort of thing, but I looked it up and it's the spirit of Leviathan, of manipulation and control, the spirit. And so I started, I, I stood on the top of my bed and I just stood up on top of my bed and I, I started screaming and declaring. And just at 3 a.m. in the morning, I started, in the name of Jesus, get out. In the name of Jesus, I cast you out of this room. And in an instant, joy flooded the room. In an instant, man, I'm praising God on the bed. And I'm just like literally dancing on the bed like MC Hammer never danced before. And it was incredible. But let me tell you, don't try to continue to hide from the fact that we are in a spiritual battle. Stop trying to do this Christian walk by thinking or or, or by agreeing with an ideology, a thought process that someone else uh, sowed a seed in years ago that has watered down the fact that there's no devil. It's, It's just in the movies. The reality is we are in a spiritual battle, and the roar of resurrection is aligning the church not to retreat, but to advance and see people set free and delivered. Amen? Number three, if the worship team can come out. The roar of resurrection declares, I made a way for humanity to be healed of all sickness and disease. So not just washed of our sins and receiving the, the, received the gift of salvation, not just delivered from demonic oppression or possession, but now the power of God. 2011, when Pastor Mark Beck's dad came down with throat and lung cancer, and um, for 10 months it shocked the family. When I say family, not just the immediate family, but the church family and and up until that point, we, you know, the supernatural was like on a drip. Um, we, were st- we were seeing little by little here and there. And uh, Pastor Lee kind of kept Pastor Mark from most of the people in the church. And only a few people were able to see him. We saw him once during the 10 months. And that was halfway through at Easter. And we went down to the green room. And he was just withered like a little s- stick. Just eyes sockets sunk in. And, and just looked like he was on the verge of dying. And... Man, the church rallied, and we prayed for him. We stood in the gap, and man, it was, it was hard when it's right there, and it's right in front of you. And we remember the, the day on the 10-month mark where Pastor Mark went in for a doctor's appointment, and he drove down the, the hill at the church in Brisbane, Australia, and drove down the hill and departed, and he got out on the pastor's side and came around the corner in tears, weeping with joy, and he looks at Becky and it gives her a massive hug and he says, I'm cancer free. Jesus has healed me. Absolutely cancer free. Talk about a roar filled city points. An aggressive faith rose up in every single one of us to the point where a lady came and uh, she, she got prayer and she had a bowling bi- bowl size tumor within her stomach that was stage four cancerous. Guess what? The church prayed for her. Man, she went to the doctor the next day. They couldn't find the tumor. That's why when Becky and I moved here, we declared and deemed this will be a cancer-free zone. There, the, the cancer's not allowed here, let alone COVID. Get out COVID. But it, God is doing something in the body, and you need to hear the sound. It needs to get your attention. Man, when you walk past sickness, you are the answer because he resides inside of you. When you walk in this earth and you take the very thing that God has given you, and it's faith, faith, faith to believe. Faith to declare, to see. Come on, the church needs to move past just revelation knowledge. Past just the tickling of the intellect. Past just saying, come on, Pastor Aaron, now give me a good word. I don't know why I'm talking southern right now. But come on, give me a good word. That's for you, Ryan. But God, give me a good word. I need some good teaching in the house. But God, there is time for that. 
Never there has there been a day where more teaching is online, on YouTube, on podcasts, in books, in, in, in Barnes and Nobles. Come on, never has there been more teaching for us to grow as spiritual sons and daughters of God. But it's time to get past revelation knowledge and come into a divine encounter with the living Jesus Christ to a point that it changes you. It transforms you. It shifts everything in your life. How you look at life, how you perceive life how you move and how you breathe God wants to establish his church but it's not going to happen without you God every, every single one of us every single one of us to rise up and say there's a roar that we need to hear there's a roar of resurrection that is filling our nation that is filling our streets would you stand to your feet with me in this moment in this moment in this hour as the worship team prepares to sing begin to sing. Let's put our hands towards heaven. Put our hands towards heaven and prepare your heart saying, God, Lord, we, we desire for you, Lord, for that, for that, 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 that life-changing, attention-grabbing sound, Lord, to grab a hold of our hearts, Lord, to, to maneuver us, Lord, out of lukewarmness, to maneuver us out of, 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 of unbelief and, and out of, of, of cynicism and out of all that stuff, Lord, and come into a place, our eyes are set upon you. You are the lion of the tribe of Judah. And today we celebrate the roar of your resurrection, that you did not escape, you conquered, you defeated, you overcame. We stand in victory, we live from victory. Jesus' name.